What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. The final final little pass is a business. Dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, your horror safe haven. I'm Chelsea. And I'm James. I forgot my ring. You forgot your ring. Sorry. Well, I'm too busy being distracted by the fact that there's a little kitty cat outside the door. Yeah, no one can see her. Lucy, I can tell Lucy wants Lucy, come in. to come in. We miss you. She's thinking about it. We my, love you. My goal is to get both of them to be regulars on the show yeah but molly's too much of a little guard dog she is a little guard she's dog a little jealous guard dog who thinks that even though she's been here only for eight months it gives her the right to growl at lucy i saw a comment Bad on dog. the last podcast that apparently um shih tzus are good luck because uh evil spirits think that they're little lions and they so they scare the spirit the bad spirits away that's good yeah so she is a little guard dog but lucy's nice so you gotta let her come in yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right today we're talking about noroi yeah speaking of evil spirits yeah noroi the curse noroi the curse but i think noroi means curse the cur- yeah it's atm machine yeah it's the el rio grande river la brea tar pits it's, trying to think of other ones. Um, yeah, there's more. Yeah, there's more. I can't think of any. Yeah, I hadn't seen this before, and I really, really wanted to because I heard it was a very good found footage. And I'm kind of a sucker for found footage at this point. I love point. found footage. I just really like found footage. It scares me. Um, this one's nice, and it it's a. Uh, I think found footage. There's kind of the idea that it's very jump scare heavy. And that's not what this is. There's and that's not what hardly any, yeah. the best found footage tends to be. The original Blair Witch is not jump scare heavy. The original Paranormal Activity, it's got some, but that's not really what it relies on, Yeah, I think. It's and more of a dreadful situation. Yeah, Lake Mungo is just kind of slow and scary. And this is also, this would be a good double feature, I think, with Lake Mungo. That's the thing, is before watching this, I hadn't heard of this. I don't know, two months ago, maybe. Mm-hmm. So, like, it was a recent thing that I started hearing about, even though the movie's from 2005. I think it was a distribution thing. I think right. it just was hard to find. I don't think it was available for uh, kind of Western audiences until Shudder got it for Shudder Canada in 2017, and it didn't come to the United States on Shudder until 2020. So it's oh, that recently available. That's probably why... I started seeing it everywhere. The past few years, people, yeah. It's people seeing it for the first time. For sure. And it's, yeah, it's from 2005, so nearly 20 years old now. A Japanese, and that's, like, J-horror was so big back then. Mm-hmm. Like, this is the year. These are the years of The Ring and The Grudge. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure if it's maybe coming in right at the tail end of that. I think it is because even the remake of The Ring was, what, 2001? Or was yeah. it 2003? I can't uh, remember. It was in that range. It might have been 2002. You might have danced around it. But I feel like the j Hor American imports were a brief little uh, blossom between the Scream fad, like the Scream mm-hmm. teen slasher fad, and then the torture porn yeah. that we got with Saw and Hostel. And there's always overlap and, you know, uh, simultaneous subgenre yeah. blooms. But I feel like it really dominated the early 2000s. And so maybe that's why this didn't. I mean, that and the distribution problems, mm-hmm. why it didn't become bigger. It's good. It's Definitely slow, though. Uh, it is. It's I, slow. I heard it hyped a lot before we watched it. And like, oh, it's terrifying. It's got some good scares in it. But if you go into this expecting it to be like, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like Hell House was a recent Hell one House. that we watched that was like pretty that scary was throughout. That scare heavy. And pretty, it scared yeah, me yeah, yeah. so bad. <laughs> uh, this is not bad at all. This is a slow burn. It's very, uh, <laughs> I like how many different things they introduce that all tie together. Yes, that's what I think is really impressive about this is there are so many woven together threads because not only is it a found footage and I think traditionally you think of again like Blair Witch it is just the one person's camera it is their footage and that's about it they are making a documentary in that but there's not if I remember correctly I don't think there's many like other sources that they are using in their documentary it's it's all stuff they've filmed it's all stuff that they filmed this 
you have the kind of beginning framework of we are about to show you this documentary this guy made and within that documentary there's all kinds of footage from different things yeah, which i think like makes media. it really cool it yeah it does especially the japanese variety show the variety show on, segments the are my favorite part of this great. movie yeah it's down to the little detail. And those segments remind me of you would go on websites like, I don't know, I'm blanking on what, like in the 2000s, what we would have been fucking around on. But there were always kind of viral clips of Japanese game shows from that exact time period, the kind of early mid 2000s. And that's my memory of what they look like. Yeah. Like exactly. the little picture in picture of the, the people picture reacting. in picture with a panel of people reacting to what's happening was just so. It's it so felt it's so real. Yeah. yeah because of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I, I mostly liked it. It nearly two hours long. So it's on the longer side for a horror movie, especially a found footage. And <laughs> I'm sorry, but there's one character who I hate. I don't think you're alone in that from different Reddit threads I was reading and different reviews. He's, he just seems... He's a lot. ...tonally out of place, uh, seems like too much of a cartoon. Yes. And and then they, like, he's there, and then they they go back to him later. They're like, hey, you, come with us for the rest of the movie. And you're like, fuck, fuck damn it. We didn't have to bring him with us. It's a good costume, though. If I saw someone walking around like that at a costume, I'd be like, okay, that's great. Yeah. But as far as having to watch the character on screen, I was like, oh, man. Yeah, he's a lot. But uh, yeah, I would definitely say go check it out. It's on Shutter still, so you can go watch it. And uh, it is, <laughs> for our purposes, not struck. That's why we're able to talk about it. Right. Thanks, uh, Japan. <laughs> Thanks, Japan. <laughs> um, should we just go right into spoiler? Building? Yeah, I got my sake. Sake. Sa sake. Sake. I'm not. I, I'm never sure which way it's the correct. I got. Way. I got a little bit of that because someone left it from the party. And I got my Pokemon shirt on. There you go. I'm fucking decked out, dude. Yeah. I didn't realize you you kind of got... I wish I got the memo, although I can't think of what I would wear. I would have worn my Kuropi sweatshirt, but I left it on a fucking plane, and Delta uh, did not succeed in finding it. Yep. the One of the best gifts I've what, ever gotten Truly you. one of my favorite presents you've ever gotten me. I left it on a plane. I'm so sorry. Yeah. It's because I doubled up sweatshirts that day, which I normally don't do. But I remember the flight to where we were going was so fucking cold. Everyone on the plane was complaining like it was unreasonably cold. Mm -hmm. and I was like, well, I don't want that to happen again. I'm going to wear two sweatshirts. And then I took off the Kuropi sweatshirt, then forgot I had two sweatshirts on. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to just buy another one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <thanks. laughs> you still got to say that I got it for you, though. Or mm -hmm. I'll just buy you another one, I guess. Yeah. I will buy you a Kuropi, perfect, shiny, and new. Like that one, Russell? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if you... We can never escape 90s music. Yeah. If you work for Delta and you listen to this, can you check get the lost and found at LAX for me? <laughs> See if it's still there. <laughs> I miss it. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's get started. We have this cool kind of um, unsolved mysteries framework. Yeah. Of what? Oh, did that light go out again? I think it did. What the fuck? I wonder if it's just getting overheated Tired. or something. Oh. Something. Or it's a ghost. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You ever consider that? Yeah. You ever think, what if maybe ghost? Yeah, I don't know what's going on with that. Because it was back on when I flipped all the lights on, but oh well. Yeah. All right. Yeah, There's the documentarian's name is uh, Kobayashi. Kobayashi, yeah. And uh, we right off the bat find out that his house burned down, his wife died, and he went missing. Yes. So we're just waiting for all these terrible things to happen to this very nice seeming man yeah i saw someone describe him as a marshmallow a hundred percent he's very much a marshmallow he just seems like a really nice guy he like is... he he's like a paranormal investigator no i'm sorry he is a reporter of the supernatural that's, that's right his title yeah mm -hmm. he's he's like a paranormal investigator but not the kind of travel channel not the bullshit ghost hunters this man like, just is doing actual journalism but it happens to be about ghosts and demons yeah yeah because he's he's checking out this lady who says that she keeps hearing weird baby noises coming from her neighbor's house yeah well that's when we get into the actual 
documentary. Yeah. We have this like weird frame and then it goes and it's like, we're going to show you the document and then you go into. Oh yeah, because this, the fire and his disappearance happened right after the completion of, of his latest documentary, documentary yeah. The Curse is yeah. what it was called. So right. yeah, the, the the documentary itself is him investigating these weird baby noises that a lady says she's hearing from her neighbor who doesn't have a baby. Yeah. Uh, this neighbor is very, uh, she doesn't like the way he talks to her. She's just very crazed. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, she doesn't seem very nice. Um, a little unkempt. And she apparently has a little boy mm-hmm. with he her. He stares creepily out the window. We see him through the window. Uh, and then, of course, our our investigator takes the noise, the sounds from the stuff that he shot and brings it to a sound analyst. A sonic analyst. He yes. shows up a few times in this. And I, I just like... The little room that he's kind of in. It's got a very comforting early 2000s All the little, feel. like, there's a local historian. There's just all these, like, random experts that he goes to that feel very much like characters who would pop up in a documentary. Yeah, it's, it's really great. Mm-hmm. Uh, they analyze the sound, and my favorite is that... I don't know if this is a translation thing, but it's a funny way to describe what the sound is. Either Kobayashi or the sound analyst describe it as being uh, like the voices of more than five babies. <laughs> yeah. Greater <laughs> Not than a lot five of babies. babies. More, like more than five. And first he rules out cats. And I'm like, that doesn't sound like a cat. It sounds like a baby. He's yeah. like, it sounds like a cat, but it's not a cat. I was like, yeah, I know it's not a cat. It's a baby. He's like, it sounds like more than five babies. I was like, oh, I didn't yeah, know there was more, more than, than five. five there. All right. You got me. Right. You got me. All right. <laughs> yes. That woman's name was we learned junko ishii mm-hmm. uh and apparently right after our investigator goes to talk to her she and her kids just move out yep they vacate the premises uh they go back to look at her apartment and there's dead birds everywhere dead pigeons mm-hmm. all over the yard which i think is like uh part of japanese superstition or oh folk, okay like birds at least I could be a like bad omen in most cultures a dead bird especially birds flying into a window like that that happens tends a lot in this. to be a bad omen yeah in general i know seamen are always talking about birds yeah thanks lighthouse yeah dead seagulls and whatnot mm-hmm. the original people that they interview uh the neighbors of this junko ishi the ones who were complaining about the weird baby noises apparently like her and her family die like five days after <laughs> well, the this. way they do it because it's it's a mom and her little girl and it's after they find the birds and the the guys leaving them and the little girl's like see you later and then it freeze frames on them and it's like five days later they died i was like, like what oh, the fuck, fuck dude <laughs> this really cute <laughs> little girl laugh, yeah <laughs> it's like oh man um i learned uh hashtag pigeon facts if you want some interesting... Did you just find something out right now? Or no, this it... is something I read on Twitter the other <laughs> We're day. We're filming a podcast. Quit looking up bird facts. I'm not looking up bird facts. <laughs> what do we got? Apparently, pigeons were... I, I mean, I knew that we used them as, like, carrier birds, right? Like, they're basically doves. We would use them to, like, deliver shit. And they have really um, great, like, homing device. Like, they're able... They have great senses of direction. But I didn't realize that pigeons... We basically completely domesticated them like dogs. Like they just, they were animals that we used as tools essentially. But once technology got to the point where we didn't really need them anymore, we just kind of stopped taking care of them. And that's why pigeons are so fucking stupid. They're domestic. (laughs) Like they don't know how to. Is that how they wound up in the mob? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. They had to turn to organized crime. To take care of themselves. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay, this is when we get to the variety TV show footage. Yeah, this is a bunch of kids in a classroom. They're trying to find out which ones of them are um, clairvoyant. Yeah, so they have a... Uh, I forget, is he like a... Uh, like a, is he a clairvoyant? The guy that they have running the experiment? No, He's no. like some kind of expert. And he says they've brought in students from all over Japan that have some kind of ESP talent. Like they all have some kind of ability and they're all, they're going to test all these kids. That's when we see the little box in the corner of a panel reacting like, oh, yes. <laughs> um, what they do is first they give all these kids a 
they give them each a bottle with a drawing in it and they can't see the drawings all like rolled up in there and stuff they can't see through the bottle and they have the kids kind of hold the bottles and they draw what they think the drawing is in the bottle and there's one little girl that just keeps getting it right over and over again the drawings are really specific like the first one is it's two um it's like one big circle a smaller circle inside of that one but the circles each have gaps in the lines that are in really specific spots and this girl just get like nails it yeah kana yano kana yano and so she keeps oh there's a bug so she keeps just over and over again getting it right except for the last one which I think the drawing in the bottle is some kind of math equation, but instead she just draws this really creepy face. Yeah. And they're like, oh, uh, she must be tired. Like, we must have <laughs> pushed her too hard. Whatever. <laughs> no need to. But then she materializes water. Yes, that's the second experiment is they then give the kids like beakers and they want them to materialize water. She, she just apparates water. She she apparates into existence. Yeah. And it's hairy water. There's a hair in it. Yeah, they have it tested and apparently the water they determine it's fresh, either like lake or river water. I'm guessing it's from the dam. Yes, and yeah, there's a hair on. in it that they can't determine. They're like either it's an animal or a human infant we're not sure oh yeah they're mm -hmm. like it could be a baby hair yeah so that's really cool and gross <laughs> um so we we get to see kana a bunch more in this movie she becomes very very important there's another variety show clip with an actual actress an actual japanese actress named marika yeah she's playing, playing herself in this yeah and she's like a voice actor right yeah marika matsumoto she voices riko in final fantasy x x2 and kingdom hearts 2 which is why i had heard of that character oh, okay. before <laughs> but yeah she plays herself in this which is kind of cool i did not realize that this was a real person there's also another actress later who plays a version of herself she's another she's she's the host that goes and visits the tinfoil guy oh, i think it's her she okay. also is like a real i think okay. she's a, ho a host and adult film star i saw that on wikipedia i was like oh okay. i think that's who i think that's who that was yeah um okay i was wondering who else would have been playing themselves but i forgot about the reporter who visits that guy yeah <laughs> our our favorite character <laughs> yeah yeah, so on this, on um, this is more like a ghost hunter show with like annoying hosts. They're they're actually very funny. These two dudes. Uber yeah, they call them. themselves the Ungirls. Yeah, and then they have uh, Mariko with them, and <laughs> there's a hilarious cut of I forget what she tells them, but they're both like oh, oh. and they just <laughs> it's very funny. <laughs> I don't know why we laughed so hard at it. <laughs> yeah, they seem like chill dudes. I would go hunt ghosts with them. Yeah, they had a very dry sense of humor. I guess they're not like the annoying. Uh, What's playing, up, guys? Yeah, we'll go they're not the like that. Ghosts, but <laughs> like graphics, graphics, <laughs> graphics. Yeah, no, they seem kind of fun. Mm -hmm. And they're they're out in the woods, and Marika's like, "Oh, I'm sensitive to like I'm feeling stuff over in this direction," and then she like ends up freaking out and having like an attack yeah, and falling well, to the ground. We're, they're visiting a shrine. Yeah, and she leads them to this kind of area near it in the woods and they find this patch of dead trees. All the other trees around this area are alive except for this kind of They're almost slimy ring. And shit. Yeah, and yeah. one of them is like slimy and Just lumpy. And, yeah. and then she says that she starts to hear a man's voice and mm. she starts screaming. Um, but then what's crazy is then we have this segment which then it zooms out to this is part of another segment. <laughs> this is being screened during a live talk show yeah. that's called Night of True Horror Stories, yes. where it's an interview with this actress, Marika, and Kobayashi, our investigator. And they bring in our our favorite guy, the tinfoil guy. Hori. Yeah, he And I'm pretty sure the music he comes out to is from Battle Royale. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's music yeah, yeah. I've heard before yeah, a lot. It sounded really familiar. And so I feel like it's, I think it's Battle Royale. Yeah. It's like, dun, 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 I'm like, where is that from? It yeah, might be yeah, Battle yeah. Royale. He comes in to examine Merica. He immediately freaks out. He tries he, to attack her. Yeah. So this guy, he's got literally a tinfoil hat He's on a tinfoil hat guy. And a hat, like he's, tinfoil um, all over. He's, um... Better call Saul's brother. He's uh, what's his face? Michael. Uh, 
Michael McKean, yeah. I'm just yeah, like spinal. Just season one. I can't remember his fucking name. Yeah, yeah, season one. Yeah, that's what I thought of anyway. Yeah. But no, because that guy is a a good nuanced character. This dude is like, he's so. I did think oh, that he so much. If you took the tinfoil off, because the type of hat he's wearing, he it's would like just be dressed hat. like Guy La Douche from MXC. Yes, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Which this movie would be so much better if it was just Guy La Douche running around interviewing people for the documentary. The, this guy, like, yeah, he's got like wide eyes, and he's he's just he, he looks. I don't know if he's supposed to be. I was simple. Or I was something. reading. On Reddit, Quotes. some people were discussing this character, and I saw someone say that if you speak Japanese, this character like plays a lot. More. Like you get more of the nuance rather than if you don't know the language, it might just all kind of sound like screaming. Well, later when they go to in, like interview him at his home, and they're like, "He's a super psychic," but then they talk to a neighbor, and the neighbor's like, "Super psychic seems more like a psycho to me," but. Whatever word they're saying where the they translation is psycho, they're bleeping. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and are it, they calling him a, a slur? Like, is it like an R word type yeah. slur? Or like, and someone who speaks Japanese, can you explain that bleep to us? Yeah. I would, I'm very interested. Because the interviewer I, repeats it and it bleeps it for her. I'm curious if there's even a direct translation. There must not be because psycho, we wouldn't bleep. We wouldn't so. bleep. So, yeah. I don't know. I'm, I, I'm interested in learning. The so, weird yeah, little... that's that's my guess is that they're calling him something more like a, mentally right. challenged or however you would say it. And mm -hmm. that's kind of how he's playing. And it's just it's it, a lot. It's a lot, yeah. man. And especially for a movie where the tone is so slow and atmospheric and there's all these mysteries and like you really want to. And then this guy just comes fucking barging in with his <laughs> tin foil. Just, shh, 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 yeah. Just, all the interviews of people are just everyone's like very quiet and talking about the weird things that are happening to them. And then he comes in like, Oh, oh you're in oh, danger! Pigeons! He yells at her to beware of pigeons! Yeah, and Molly, they basically scary. wrestle him down to the floor. I guess that puts an end to that little talk show they were doing. It <laughs> seemed fun. Yeah, until he arrived. Until he showed up. Kobayashi, the investigator who made the documentary, he goes and meets the directors of the variety show, not the one with the little girl. The one with Marika and the The one with honest. America where she heard the America. voices. Is it, yeah, I don't know, America. I'm America, I'm, I'm worried. America. I'm, well, because America. <laughs> yeah. America's a character in Elden Ring, and I'm worried I'm just pronouncing it like that. Uh, well, what what we have been told in comments is that in Japanese, all the vowels are always pronounced the same. So Kobayashi Marika. Marika. I think. Marika. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Not America. The America! <laughs> <laughs> Problematic queen of the lands between America. Anyway, Gressel, no Gressel knows. This guy gets it. <laughs> <laughs> that vowel thing uh, came up with Zelda because Erica and I would say Hateno. Or Hateno, what we would say it wrong. Yeah. Hateno. And then Ross, who, Hateno? you know, like has yeah. more experience with Japanese media and stuff, said it different. And we were pronouncing it in a like romance language or Germanic mm -hmm. language way. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Because we'd never heard it out loud because there's no voice in Zelda. Yeah. 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 The directors of the variety show, uh, Mariko's on, they reveal that they gave her this footage. But before they gave it to her, they erased something from it because they didn't want to frighten her. And so we get a look at the unedited footage. And it turns out when she heard the man's voice that there was a figure behind her at this shrine. It is spooky. It's, it's, like, got, it's got a face that's kind of like the one that Kana drew. Mm -hmm. Yes. Weird kind of lopsided mm -hmm. eyes and a little tiny mouth. Mm -hmm. Kind of bulbous head. A little alien looking. It it is, yeah. yeah. Um, and I maybe I'm misremembering, but is this figure a small boy that they show, or is you it a man? No, I think he was just far away. Just a guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Chelsea, it wasn't a small person. He was just far away. <laughs> 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 I don't know if you know how that works. Yeah, but. let me. I know this. This might come as a shock, but that person's just standing far away. <laughs> They're not actually. They can't actually fit in your hand. <laughs> you can't actually crush them. You with can't your actually crush them. Yeah. 
<laughs> Those pictures of your family um, leaning on the Leaning Tower of Pisa, <laughs> they're not actually doing it. <laughs> Hey, I want to talk to you about our first sponsor this week, Uncommon Goods. Halloween is over, so you know what that means. Rip those decorations down because it's already time to worry about the holiday season. I love giving gifts, but I also worry about one-upping myself each year. If you also live in fear of running out of cool gift ideas, Uncommon Goods is here to make your holiday shopping stress-free. They search the globe high and low for the most remarkable and truly unique gifts that'll make everyone on your list happy. I've talked about it before, but I got myself a desk lamp from Uncommon Goods last year, and I still absolutely love this thing. I genuinely use it every day, and it can cycle through all kinds of fun colors and patterns. I'll even match it to stuff I'm playing or working on. I got back into Sea of Thieves for a little bit, and I would set it to fun ocean blues and greens to get myself in the mood for sailing. When you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses. These fine products are often made in small batches, so shop now before they sell out this holiday season. And with every purchase you make at Uncommon Goods, they give back $1 to a nonprofit partner of your choice. They've donated more than $2.5 million to date. To get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash deadmeat. That's uncommongoods.com slash deadmeat for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. Our next sponsor this week is Nuts.com. On the last episode of the podcast, we talked all about Halloween candy and seasonal treats. Maybe it left you feeling a bit hungry, or maybe it even left you with a craving beyond the typical handful of candies that you'll easily find each year. Cashews, almonds, pistachios, dried mango, crystallized ginger, jelly beans, root beer barrels. You'll find all that and more at Nuts.com. Nuts.com is your one-stop shop for freshly roasted nuts, dried fruit, sweets, pantry staples like specialty flowers, and more. Their wide selection means something for everyone. And at Nuts.com, quality is top priority. They roast their nuts and pop their corn the same day it ships, so they reach you deliciously fresh. Satisfaction is guaranteed. We were very lucky to receive a package from Nuts.com right before our Halloween party, and the star of the show was easily the chocolate-covered gummy bears. Those things went so fast. I only had one. A single one. I blinked and they were gone. The one I had was very, very good, and I didn't know I should have appreciated it more in that moment. We have some of the more grown-up snacks left over from our Nuts.com package, and we've put them out for easy access when you walk by our kitchen island. There's something really cozy about it, like a jar of candies out at Grandma's, but just a smidge healthier. Right now, Nuts.com is offering new customers a free gift with purchase and free shipping on orders of $29 or more at Nuts.com slash dead meat. So go check out all of the delicious options at Nuts.com slash dead meat. You'll receive a free gift and free shipping when you spend $29 or more. That's Nuts.com slash dead meat. We also learned that apparently the psychic girl, Kana? Yeah. She uh, she had a fever ever since she recorded her variety show that has now, this fever's apparently broken, but now she's, as creepy kids in horror movies often do, she's just, she's been talking to someone that's not there. and Saying making stuff creep- like, I guess it's too late for all of us. Yeah, while making creepy drawings. Thanks, Kana. You know, there's a checklist of things kids do. <laughs> doing horror movies that are weird it's this, weird drawings it's this is when they're eating the meal and all the stuff slides off the table mm, it's a really cool mm-hmm. effect yeah that all the dinner great. plates slide across the table kind of starts screaming if you want to learn more about creepy kids and horror movies by the way we did a two-parter this was years ago at this point but one of the episodes i think the second half we talk a lot about j horror and creepy kids and this kind of reminded me of that there's just certain things that it seems are universally weird about kids that freak out adults like kids making a scary drawing in real life kids do and say weird shit and I think drawings are gonna be one of the places where they draw things where you're like what the fuck what were the what were my sister's uh boyfriend's kids saying they granny's home yeah we were visiting we were visiting family and james's sister's boyfriend's daughters are they're they're so cute i adore them i love them but they would come into the room we were sitting in and just go 
granny's back and then leave. <laughs> it's fucking weird, man. It's a little three-year-old saying that. You're like, what the, who, what the <laughs> fuck are you talking about, kid? Yeah. <laughs> Kids are weird. Anyway, we get a more variety show footage. I think this is... Uh, when they're the- dead, they go find uh, Hori, the tinfoil guy tinfoil guy he's talking about ectoplasmic worms being all over yeah he's written messages space. like all of his like his house and garbage is graffiti all over mm-hmm. um this feels very have you read any junji ito i forget i have not uh like in spiral <laughs> that happens i mean because that the whole thing in that is like the spiral pattern just kind of starts making everyone go nuts. But in that, people are kind of obsessively drawing it and putting it places and it ends up all over stuff. And it kind of reminds... Like, this is a very Junji Ito neighborhood in this movie. <laughs> Lots of motifs. Yeah, uh, he's also written down messages that he's received. And I think, is this when we kind of see that he's gotten messages of imagery that's very similar to stuff that Kana's drawn? There's these weird, like, interconnected dots and lines and all that stuff. I think the knots and everything, the loops, uh, come into play when Marika goes to visit Kobayashi again. Oh, okay. she says that she's been drawing them in her sleep, and that's when they set up, like, Got a it. Okay. camera when she's sleeping. But, uh, yeah, he's, he's just all, um, you know, he's talking about messages from space and stuff. Yeah, lots... And- Talk about worms. And then uh, Kana goes missing, the little girl. Yeah. It's reported that she goes missing. It, it jumps back and forth to all these characters and brings them together in the end. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So our, the psychic, the little psychic girl, Kana, has gone missing. Um, our tinfoil guy, uh, apparently Kana, specifically insisted he was not a threat because apparently, I think tinfoil guy showed up at Kana's yeah, home to warn her, her yeah. that she was in danger and mm-hmm. Kana insisted to her parents no this this you know this guy is not a danger to me he's safe we don't have to worry about him um but then after Kana went missing her parents found a flyer that looked what it looked like one of the ones that was at the tinfoil guy's house but Kana had written help on it and mm-hmm. left it in her room yeah yeah Oh, the, the tinfoil guy does mention uh, Kagutaba at this point, saying, where is Kagutaba? Oh, yeah. That's like the first utterance of Kagutaba. Yeah, because something, there's like interference, right? Oh, yeah, the there, there's a bunch of glitches on the video, and uh, this yeah, is when they're interviewing him, and it's like, the, it's that face a bunch of times, yeah, and they're and all and this blue. the tinfoil guy tries to kind of em, like envision where Kana might be, and that's when the tape starts glitching, and there's all these creepy little faces that show up, and that's Awful noise when, when he going screams, over it and he's asking, what is Kagutaba, something mm-hmm. about this. Where is Kagutaba, yeah. Yeah, uh, really disturbs him. Yeah, and is he the one who draws the map? Yes. For uh, Kobayashi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He draws like this just very uh, <laughs> cryptic map of the city with little landmarks and stuff. And so Kobayashi. It's very amazing race. Yeah, yeah. Where it's like, okay, here's this detailed-ish map of a city. You have to find a blue building that has five stories mm-hmm. and a telephone pole outside of it. And it, it just, yeah, it's very, it's very, or like the mole or something. It's a very reality show challenge. Yeah. He, he can't do it for a while. In that time, that's when... Uh, Marika visits him and is like, I'm tying knots in my sleep. Visits uh, Kobayashi, the filmmaker. Yes. Yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they they have cameras on her when she sleeps. And oh, during classic. Night- Drink. Uh, we yeah. have a yeah, found footage movie where they set up a camera while someone's sleeping. Yep, Take vision. a drink, dude. She gets up in the middle of the night. Molly didn't like it. And there's, uh, oh, yeah, she there's like a creepy makes, noise. Makes knots out of like her electric it's a lamp cord. cables. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's this it's this looping knot thing is like and a there's the recurring banging thing. noise that they keep hearing in this footage too. Oh yeah, that's right. There's all kinds of stuff. There's a lot going on. There's in this a lot going on, man. Realizing, um, there's yeah the banging noise. There's uh, they have some sound from this analyzed, and there's a voice in this footage that says Kagutaba, mm-hmm. and they don't know what that means. Like it just it's like a nonsense word to them at this point. Kobayashi. Our guy, our main guy, they finally amazing race their way to this apartment. They finally figure out which one it is. And specifically, the map tinfoil guy drew, there's 
all these creepy like lines that we think are like worms or something emanating from this one apartment and they realize that this apartment it's like the second from the right and it's the only one that has pigeons sitting on the the balcony so they figure that must be it um and they see a guy come out on the balcony just fucking grab a a pigeon do you think that was that was that a real bird? I think it was a real bird, yeah. Yeah, they just grabbed. It I, looked real. It looked real. I wonder if it's because pigeons and birds, like birds are very, especially when they're head, you know, they're 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 so squishy. I wonder if it's a thing where it looks like it would hurt the bird, but it actually doesn't. I, I'm more, how do they grab it? it? Like, you got one shot, you know, you're, you're filming up there. You got a bunch of birds. The other ones fly away when he grabs it. Like, how do you reset that shot? They're like I said, pigeons are really you, they fly back. Dumbass you can pigeons. train them and stuff. They're really they're they're smart, but they're dumb. You know, <laughs> like dogs. It's yeah, it's like you can't just have a dog running around. Like Molly would not survive in the wild. No, I was about to say, but we no, we can't train her either. But you get my point. <laughs> <laughs> I think literally you can train pigeons to do shit like that. Mm. I just want to believe they didn't hurt this cute little fat pigeon that he grabbed. <laughs> Um, yeah, that guy ends up disappearing a few days later. Yep, that guy vanishes. But too. they had heard that he was having arguments with his neighbor, who was a woman uh, with a son, but he had been arguing about hearing baby noises. And then uh, Kobayashi shows the neighbor, like, is this the woman? And it was the same woman that had been uh, at the beginning. Yep, Junko Ishii. Junko Ishii. Junko Ishii. Then we get to meet this really cute researcher character uh, who lives in seem like kind of a village oh, is he i don't the know local historian guy? yeah he kind of looks like a wise turtle <laughs> okay is what he he's just very like kindly old man mm-hmm. and i like him a lot and oh you want the dog here you go uh kobayashi asks he what he does is he cold calls just every like linguistic or historical expert he can find in the yellow pages essentially asking them if the word kagutaba means anything to them and finally he gets this one guy saying yeah this you know relates to some like historical stuff from this village nearby so he goes to visit and this is when we get a giant lore dump oh yeah i was just typing furiously trying to keep on top of all of the lore that we were being given at this point um Apparently, there was a village that used to exist that does not anymore. And they had a tradition where they would perform a ritual to pacify this demon. Well, they would summon the demon, Kagutaba. Yes. And have him, I don't know, do stuff for them? It says originally. So what it was is originally this village was basically made of, made of sorcerers like a bunch of oh, sorcerers yeah. they literally which I, use the word I don't know if that's a translate like sorcerers seems so i just think of like fantasia or something yeah um like robes <laughs> yeah yeah but sorcerers um they lived in this village and they would basically use kagutaba on their enemies they would summon him oh, and like okay. sick them on their that enemies. makes more sense i was thinking like use them to harvest crops or some shit no it says um that it was called the kagutaba method the demons were sent to adversaries but in one instance a sorcerer summoned kagutaba and kagutaba disobeyed him he said no and that's when they started performing this other spell to confine kagutaba underground and Mm -hmm. i think that's what becomes this ritual that we see the video of and that's what then becomes tradition to perform in this village. It's a tradition to confine this demon. And the village is Shimokage village. And it ends up getting, uh, why can't you just lay on me like you lay on me? <laughs> I know. Why can't Where you do you want to go? want to be with Here, me? Let's go on the floor. Okay. Um, yeah, this village that this guy's talking about doesn't exist anymore. They built a dam over it. They built a dam in over it. In 1978. But they did film... The last time that they performed this ritual in 1978. Yeah, he's got our this kind of historical expert has 16 millimeter film. And again, this is what's cool about this movie is all of the other footage that becomes part of this movie because it all looks so real to me. This mm-hmm. si- like super 16 footage from the 70s looks like it's really from the 70s down yeah. to the fact that you see the the priest 
of the village and this dude looks he's I think he's got a mustache and like he's got kind of 70s looking glasses it just mm-hmm. all feels so real and I love it so much yeah and the last time they did this ritual it involved a uh a person being dressed as Kagutaba and then that girl who was dressed as Kagutaba had like a breakdown or whatever. Yes. Which is also the the footage that opens the movie at the very, very beginning before we out have of any context, context yeah. whatsoever. It's just the scary ass mask. Mm-hmm. And then like, then we move into the film. Yeah. So the priest who performed that last ritual that kind of went wrong, uh, his name's Ishii. Mm-hmm. So keep that in mind. If that sounds familiar. I, I, <laughs> I heard that name and I was like, fuck, I feel like... We've met an Ishii, and I'm scrolling through my notes, and I just couldn't find it. Uh, but yes, if that name sounds familiar, that's a tie-in too. Well, it's because yeah, it's his daughter is Junko, Junko Ishii, Ishii, and she was the one playing Kagutaba. Yes, who had the the breakdown, and she is now the lady who keeps living next to people and getting noise complaints about her non-existent babies. Yes, making noise. Yeah, so she's obviously she's still alive, um, having a hard time finding somewhere where she can live and do her weird baby rituals and peace <laughs> maybe she's just a voice actor yeah That's right <laughs> booked playing babies so all the villagers who lived in this the shimokage village that then becomes like if they they flood it basically they build a dam and it just gets flooded they move to another village where this junko ishi the daughter who was dressed as the demon lived for a time so they go to this house and oh boy this house is the outside of it is just covered in all these these knots like we saw Marika, Marika, the actress, mm-hmm. making out of wool and the lamp cords. It's just covered in these things. Yeah, it just loops all over the place. There's also dogs all over the village. Uh, they they kind of point out that dogs play an important role in these rituals uh, in this village. Like they're very culturally important to them. A lot of cute little dogs that we see. Molly did get freaked out by all the barking in this <laughs> this movie she was not a fan um yeah he goes to visit her is that when he finds out that's the same yes because she does she answers the door of this house after asking some neighbors about her and they're like oh yeah she just moved back here from tokyo so that tracks because yeah. she disappeared from the apartment at the beginning mm-hmm. she's back here now and they're like don't like she's weird like don't bother with her just she's kind of freaky just leave her alone but of course our filmmaker can't um, and has to go knock on the door. We also learn that she, um, after this ritual, I think her father passed away. She went to nursing school in Tokyo. Um, and everyone who knew her when she was younger said that after this kind of failed demon ritual that she's been different. She's acted strangely. And she told her friends that she apparently heard God's voice and had to obey it, and so. apparently that voice was telling her to steal aborted embryos. Yeah. She was like like late abortion, like 22nd week abortion, stealing the embryos. And yeah. Fetuses. We learned she started working at an obstetric clinic where they performed illegal late term abortions, mm-hmm. um, like 22 week abortions, I think is what they say. Yeah. And yeah, Junko was in charge of disposing them, but there was rumors that she just took them home with her, which... I wonder how those rumors started. Yeah. And like, how they just stayed rumors. Yeah. And were something it, that was no like... No one investigated. A, yeah, it wasn't like established one way or the other. I feel like if you hear that rumor, you might want to figure out if that's true or not. Yeah, no one's like, well, it's not my business. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, it's 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 so funny because he goes to visit her and she comes out and she's like doing the same like, how dare you talk to me like that? And then it's like, oh yeah, she, we literally found out her name was Junko, Junko Ishii, Ishii. Yeah. When we inter- when we first saw her, and then we heard that the priest's name was Ishi, and that his daughter was doing this, and I I never put the two together mm-hmm. until she answered the door again. Yeah, this is we're finally getting around to the part in the movie or parts in the movie where all these little threads are coming together because every person yeah (laughs) every person and every little thing in this movie is connected even though it seems very chaotic at first and there's a bunch of characters um yeah it's it's neat 
Kana, who is still missing, uh, her dad ends up stabbing her mom and yeah. just like turning himself in. And it's just like, I think with stuff like this and then uh, uh, Marika's upstairs neighbor hangs herself along with Osawa, the guy who grabbed the pigeon and some other strangers. In, the, in a park. Yeah. I think that's all just like this curse is driving these people uh, who come too close to it to like kill themselves. And that's what I assume happened to the lady in the car accident from the beginning. I'm assuming she just like drove her car mm-hmm. into the median. Yeah. And that's something that is, it's, it's simultaneously cool and frustrating about this movie because there are a lot of things you don't get answers for, but also that's kind of the point. Yeah. And I bet that if we watched it a second time, one, knowing the pace of the movie and what it's doing, I, I would have a better time watching it. Not that I didn't enjoy it, but just like I would have my expectations uh, correctly calibrated. And two, you might, you know, now that all these disparate pieces, you see the way they come together near the end, you might be able to, to figure right, stuff out a Right, and know what to pay attention to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's, it's, I saw a review of this point out that it's kind of cool that there are a lot of threads that, you don't get answers for because ultimately this is a documentary made by someone who was looking for those answers but wasn't able to find them all so Mm -hmm. it's fine that everything's not so neatly wrapped up it kind of makes it feel a bit more real that there's just weird little tangents that like we're not really sure why seven people decide to hang yeah, themselves. Yeah, who the, who the other strangers yeah, were. Yeah, and who the other people are. Like, we know two of them. We don't know the rest, but we can right. assume they are also tangentially related. Yeah. Uh, Marika has this little... I, I guess if we just get a little video clip that her friend was recording just during a visit where she was making her food. Well, I think it was. it's um, uh, Kobashi's wife. Oh, it because is Because, yeah, America, oh, okay. America, or Marika goes to stay with them mm-hmm. um after her upstairs neighbor uh hangs herself she just doesn't want to stay there anymore so she goes to stay with the filmmaker and his wife so i think okay. it's video footage of, of her and the wife yeah but marika starts like moaning and freaking out and falling to the ground then birds are running into the window flying mm-hmm. into the window i guess running would that would, that they're bad. naruto running into the <laughs> window like, head huh? first roadrunner <laughs> Uh, so yeah, she's worried that she's going to be the next to die according to this curse. And then they, they go and get, uh, tinfoil guy, which sucks, but like they got the whole band together. You got Marika, you got Kobayashi and you got Hori, the tinfoil guy. Mm -hmm. He's terrified of a picture of Junko Ishii, but, um, Marika wants to go to the dam and try to do the ritual like in a boat over the where the I village mean, would be to demon, try to like close this whole you thing. You know what demon stuff you think of talk to me? They're like, what if we just do it again? Yeah. I guess at a certain point that's what you're gonna do is like, well, we could just try it again and maybe it'll all cancel itself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For sure. Yeah. So they go to yeah, the dam. So now this whole village is underwater and they kind of figure out, all right. We think this shrine where this ritual would be performed is like right about here. So they get in a boat to sit. I love this over thing because the ritual that we saw in the from the seventies had um like a a rope between two pillars that they cut during the and ritual. And there's dancing like the Kagutaba. Oh yeah, is yeah. Just doing this whole. But like, I love how they recreate it in the boat. They just have a little <laughs> rope tied like across the canoe from end to end that they cut. It's funny. <laughs> It may. It, I was thinking about the nature of rituals like that. Like, say you assume that demons and spirits and all of that are real. Is it a thing where if you have someone performing it like this, where they're in a boat and it's very tiny and small scale and we're not doing the whole elaborate costume, is the demon or spirit sitting there like, it, yeah, I guess it counts. Yeah. I'll, I'll let At this... At what point this do, is, are they like, uh, uh, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. On a technicality, this counts. Therefore, I will stop haunting your village uh-huh. kind of thing. Where You know what I mean? Yeah, like what's the bare minimum for it to count? Are more are some demons more forgiving than other ones? It might just be, yeah, I catch them on a good day. Yeah. if not, they're like, no, sorry, you yeah. didn't. You weren't I need a more like three feet back from where you're supposed to be. I need a more song and dance for my mm-hmm. ritual. Thank you. But yeah, yeah we uh, we think it works. Maybe? Yeah, I, th- I think so because I think Marika lives. She's the only one who like 
gets out of this kind of scot free. And I guess she has to because she's playing a version of herself. So to, make, to so. so to sell this as more real, this actress has to survive. I don't know. Did did Anna Faris survive? Uh, Keanu. No, was it Keanu or was it? Um, I don't know. It was Keanu? I'm mixing up the scenes from Keanu and what's the other one? The end of the world one. Oh, well, that one, yeah, plenty of people die, but Keanu's at least a little more grounded. And you, did you see that movie? Oh, I'm pretty sure. I know Anna Faris yeah, is yeah, in I it. Yeah, yeah, I think you're I think right. she might she like plays get shot herself, and yeah. get killed. I'm not sure. But <laughs> yeah, I either way. <laughs> yeah, but a found footage is different. Yeah. A found footage, you're trying to sell as somewhat real or at least get people to buy into it while they're watching it. Mm-hmm. And if you have an actress where people know who she is, then you kind of it's it's even if you know it's fake, there's that disconnect. I think if you can't. Yeah, I wonder off. if that's why they. they I think I think it has alive. to be. Yeah. yeah. Mm hmm. Uh, but yeah, so it seems to work for her. But uh, tinfoil guys on the shore, and he starts freaking out, saying it's bad, saying they should like come and 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 you row get their back boat to ashore. The shore. Yep. I and, mean, he is. Scre- like the He's next screaming. 10 minutes are of him screaming and running through the woods. Yeah. This is where I'm like, okay, we can cut a little bit of this. For sure. And from this two hour movie. Because yeah. the cameraman runs off chasing after Hori and yeah. they find. Hori's the tinfoil guy and he's screaming out Kana. Yeah, That's yeah, when he he's takes off through Kana. the woods, the little girl. And they like girl. they find all the dogs that are dead in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know what else they find. Like kind so, of like a, a collapsed structure. Yeah, they find a collapsed shrine. There's like a ton of dead dogs. There's rope kind of strung around the trees that have I think it's pigeon like feathers, feathers and feet. And, yeah. Um, very uh like chicken and bird feet feel very like oh that's real witchy shit yeah 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 that's like that's not fun shit. like bewitched witchy or like harry potter witchy that's like oh gross mm-hmm. like baba yaga kind of witchy yeah, backwoods like mm-hmm. like the witcher or something gressel like it, where it's just all gross yeah meanwhile kana or no not kana uh marika and kobayashi they are also in the woods I think it's I think it's Marika and the cameraman. Oh, it's Marika and the cameraman. Yeah, and, and Kobayashi, Kobayashi and is Hori? carrying his own camera with him. Kobayashi and Hori are together. They're the ones who find the shrine. Oh yeah, okay. And then it's Mar- Marika and the cameraman who we never I see. see. Yes, but there's always a second guy with Kobayashi who's like always. He's yeah, off camera. we see him a little bit because I think she like goes falls to the ground and he like sets the camera yes, down. But, uh-huh. but yeah, he's mostly unseen. But yeah, okay, so it's Kobayashi uh, with Hori and they find all this this witch shit and then like the shot of the movie. The possibly? shot of the movie, yeah, I'd say because it's terrifying. It it's, is very unexpected. And it's really like creepy. under a, uh, I guess it's called a tori. In okay. The, uh, the woods, which is one, like a gate, one of those Japanese uh, gates uh-huh. that's a, uh, uh, I guess it separates the the mundane from the spiritual. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's like the two pillars and then usually like a, a um arced roof over it but yeah. there's there's like a makeshift one of those in the woods and then i guess in the night vision of the camera or whatever there's just it's kana kana with a pile of dead babies but that they're are like they're moving. crawling they're like they're they're, they're not embryos. quite babies they're like almost fully developed embryos yeah that are all crawling and screaming and they're on, like crawling on it's her it is terrifying truly because this movie up to this point, like there is some creepy imagery, but it's not as in your face as this. So when you get to just look at this for a little bit and it's loud and mm. really unexpected and, and graphic, it's yeah, it's it's. <laughs> and this is I'm assuming like the embryos are the space or the worms. Yes, the I think they are the worms. ectoplasmic worms yeah. that Hori keeps screaming about. Mm-hmm. Um, meanwhile. America is writhing on the ground in the woods and the cameraman's trying to help her and then she just like snaps out of it Mm -hmm. and I think she kind of crossed the bound like she left maybe where the village kind of Uh. ends I think and maybe that's why she started running was to maybe get I I don't know but it seems like 
Yeah. Whatever's happening to her, it like leaves her body and then she's totally fine. Yeah, they're both taken to the hospital. She ends up being okay. Uh, Hori is committed to an institution. Yeah. Uh, so while those two are taken care of, I guess, uh, Kobayashi <laughs> and his cameraman go to Junko's house again and they enter it. And they find... This is the one in the village with all the knots outside. Mm-hmm. And they go inside. They just break in, basically. And, ooh, you know, is smell weird in there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> bunch of birds, bunch of dead dogs, and a Junko herself hanging uh, from a rope. She's dead. And then also behind a t- He's like, there's a boy back there. And then, like, the camera, like, lifts up over a table. And, and it's like, yeah, there's a little sure boy enough, there. there's a little boy. It's her, it's her son. And then also Kana is there on the ground and Kana's dead. Kana's dead. Yeah, laying like next to this boy. We learn. We then learn that the boy actually isn't her child. We don't know where he came from. Yeah, no yeah. idea where he came from. So Kobayashi adopts him. So everything's happy ending. Uh, America is normal now. Kobayashi does keep investigating. There's some footage of him with his wife and their new adopted kid who just who doesn't talk he just is hungrily eating this omelet and (laughs) (laughs) omelet with i don't know what sauce is on that i don't know what sauce would be on there either yeah yeah i would like to learn how to make a japanese style omelet they always look really good to me yeah you get the special like square shaped pan happen yeah (laughs) do you the little they're like square shaped pans right you can do it with a round one it doesn't look as clean yeah you can learn how to do it yeah Hori escapes the institution he's in and turns out he comes and visits them. Yeah. And this is stuff that we get when the a camera is sent to a yeah. TV well, company. Don't forget that right before all this happens, um, the the researcher or like the, the historian, I guess, from the village uh, gets back in touch with Kobayashi again because it's like, I found some more stuff. He found a, a scroll in his grandfather's collection. Oh, yeah. That is also some more important lore. And it's the scroll that describes the, the Kagutaba method. And I think that this to is... To summon him? This is the one to summon Kagutaba to sick him on your enemies. And it was made... Much. And it was done with a bunch of dead monkey babies? Yeah. So what is a, me- a psychic medium has to eat a sacrifice of like a bunch of baby monkeys and dogs. And so that's why Junko has been kidnapped stealing these Kana. kidnapped Kana because she's a psychic and uh. has also been stealing all these aborted babies. And she basically substituted them in for the monkeys for baby monkeys. Cause I guess technically sure again, demons like, I'll accept it, you know? I guess it works. I admire, you know, points her creativity. I'll let it work. Yeah, primates, Um, yeah. She fed a bunch of these aborted babies to Kana, and that's how they resurrected Kagutaba. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's gross. Then, uh, after, I guess, the film that we're watching, Noroi, is completed, two days after that, Kobayashi's house burns down. Yeah, and his, like we found out in the beginning. Yeah, like we found out. Yeah, so his wife is dead um, and Kobayashi's missing. And then that's when you're thinking like, wait, what about that kid they adopted? We don't hear anything about that kid. Mm-hmm. So then it's, that's when the publishing company gets the package with... With a camera and a tape in it giving you just the last little bit of it. It's uh, footage of them at home with the kid. And then Hori, who has escaped the institution, uh, shows up and tries to kill this kid. And he yeah, like, with a rock. He has like just a rock in his hand. And he hits the kid in the head, and then the kid's face turns into uh, uh, Kagutaba. Kagutaba. Yeah. And it's super scary. It's creepy. It's just for one shot. It's yeah. not like that the whole time. And then there's like the ghost of Kana behind them mm-hmm. and stuff, just looking like a proper Japanese ghost. Also, in true found footage fashion, which I love, uh, Kobayashi does not set that fucking camera down. Even I know. when even, even when his wife sets when herself on fire. His wife sets it herself on fire. And when, when Hori comes in and is trying to kill both his wife <laughs> and this little kid, Kobayashi's like, dude, I gotta film it's for the gram, you know? Yeah. I'm filming, like <laughs> come hell or high water. I am a paranormal journalist and I will be filming all of this. <laughs> but yes, turns out that the kid who was not Junko's son was probably Kagutaba. Yeah, that's what we're thinking, at least. Mm -hmm. I think, what, yeah, this little kid just is this demon Mm -hmm. brought back. Who's who's brought back, reincarnated in this kid. Then uh, I guess uh, took 
Kobayashi and yeah, we don't know where Kobayashi they, the went. The movie ends it's, with like Kobayashi still missing. It's left very open ended, yeah. and yeah, Kana also confirms like Kagutaba lives. That's what she, her ghost says. Oh, okay, I missed that. Yeah. All right. So, we so yeah, know. lots of stuff, lots of stuff in there. Yeah, I like it. I like I like it too. It's again, it's slow. I wasn't as scared as I thought I was going to be. I've seen a lot of people tr- saying that it's the best found footage movie ever. Ooh. Personally, it is not my favorite. It's not my favorite, but I did I did quite like it. It's good, especially yeah. b- big points in its favor is all of the various pieces levels of footage of, fr- yeah the mm-hmm. level the like kind of the threads of the story and also all of the footage from different sources is what makes this like so i think often people maybe degrade found footage for being low effort and something like this especially is very much not if you're faking footage from multiple sources it all has to look different even a different time period in one respect with the the ritual from the 70s mm-hmm. like that's really cool to me and that's a big reason why i liked this yeah is that's a lot of effort put in to make this feel real and to create a world um yeah and like i said it's on shutter there's no dvd or blu-ray release at least in the u.s and i'm wondering how much of a higher quality image there could be because shutter kind of has a low bit rate when i was Googling this movie, I just wanted to see what I could find about it. There were a lot of, I think, Reddit threads, or or at least one that I saw where people were like, is there anywhere I can find this where it doesn't look like shit? So (laughs) I don't know. It might just look like shit. It might just not look good. uh, A good transfer would be great for home release. Get on that, maybe Vinegar Syndrome. or (laughs) Yeah, right. Arrow. Arrow. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's Noroi. Uh, I wish I had more to offer in the way of analysis I, I guess the only thing i really could speak with any authority on is just the kind of the, the creepy kid phenomenon but we just we cover that a lot more in depth in an older podcast episode if that's something that interests you mm-hmm. uh but yeah there i i'm i was thinking after i watched this like why is japanese horror specifically like really scary to me like japanese ghosts um and I don't know, like haunted stuff. I think maybe it's just because it's stylistically, it's very, it's not something I would have grown up with. So it just feels very yeah. novel to me. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's another level of the unknown. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I, I just feel like, um, especially with a culture that far removed from ours, that just sometimes uh, things that might be more innocuous to them can still feel kind of off off kilter to us because it's just so unfamiliar. Yeah. And then that that can add to our unease and like, oh, is this, why does this feel like scary? Maybe it's it's kind of like a, I don't know what I would do in this situation because culturally I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know the unspoken rules of, of superstitions and things like that, like urban legends from that kind of culture versus something set here or in like a Western mm-hmm. English speaking kind of. And Japanese culture is so old that, that, it, too. that it lends its, I think more, more weight to the supernatural and stuff. It's like, Oh, Amer- American ghosts are like, whatever. I mean, obviously there are yeah, native we, spirits and stuff. And but. that's, that's, I mean, when you think about it, that's like such a, uh, you know, one of the many losses of, you know, kind of, like cultural homogenization of of the United States and kind of loss of like Native American legends and stuff. I bet they had so many more fucking scary <laughs> stories that just didn't survive because that storytelling was all oral, I think. Mm-hmm. That would have been like passed down and at, you know, certain points in history that became illegal to pass that kind of storytelling down through the gen- so you know, I mean stuff that survived like, you know, the Wendigo and Things, but I, I just wonder how much more of an interesting kind of old storytelling fabric we could have had. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I get what you mean, though. The fact that it just feels old. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ancient. Yeah. Uh, there, <laughs> I forget if we've mentioned in previous episodes, but uh, I have another podcast coming out called Scream Dreams. Yeah. It'll premiere on November 15th. 
Uh, I am once again just the the co-host who shows up and talks. Catherine Corcoran is really doing all the work. She's the other co-host, and Barbara yeah, from Crampton, Terrifier, Catherine. Yes, Corcoran. Catherine. Ooh, my from voice Terrifier. Is yeah, your voice just shot. And uh, Barbara Crampton is there doing a side barb, which is great. And Chelsea's going to be a guest on where she's recording her episode tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So it's talking about nightmares and dreams and how that inspires and informs uh, horror filmmakers and creatives. So a lot of cool guests. I did see Josh Rubin's name was already announced publicly, so I can mention that. Oh, so you can say, okay. Mm -hmm. I I know know some other guests, but I won't say. They're good ones. They're good ones. Lots Mm -hmm. of good ones. So that's November 15th. It'll come out the same day as Dead Meat Podcast, just like I think an hour after ours come oh, okay. out. So like when you finish ours, you can go hop over there for more. There you go. Mm-hmm. Great. Uh, you can also follow social media at Dead Meat James on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. And I'm at Carebeck, C-R-E-V-E-C-C on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want merch, deadmeatstore.com. Lots of merch and more new ones coming up. Mm-hmm. Some real cool stuff. But until next time, I'm Chelsea. And I'm James. And that's Molly. And Molly's on the ground. Yeah, Molly's on the floor. <laughs> She's done. And this has been the Dead Meat Podcast.